or books or television or visual art or, or, or modern dance. Um, there's a tremendous creative economy here, a big culture industry. Um, and that comes with um, a lot of benefits, but it also presents some extraordinary challenges. Um, there's a tremendous competition for, for all of those things. Um, and we seem to have about two of everything, um, whether that's a, a daily newspaper or, um, or, a, uh, or a, a, a big uh, powerhouse public radio station. Um, and we're going to talk a, a little bit about that today. Um, for the most part, um, a lot of the other panels that you're going to hear um, at the conference today are, are about um, what, uh, how, how things should be. Um, and we're here to sort of to talk about what is right now, what's happening, um, good and bad, um, perhaps why, and perhaps where it's going. Um, and we have a fantastic panel. I can't believe they all showed up. I can't believe they all said yes. I can't believe I get to grill them for an hour. Um, and I'm going to introduce them all in one second. Um, first, quick bookkeeping. Um, we're going to try and talk up here for about 45 minutes to an hour and leave plenty of time at the end for, for, um, for audience questions. I'm not sure if anybody, they told us that there was going to be somebody distributing note cards um, if you wanted to ask questions. It seemed like a very odd thing for them to do. Good. <laughs> That's so much better. Um, and there's also, there's a, um, if you're on the Twitter, um, I, I, I don't think we have a hashtag for this session, but there's a, there's a hashtag for the entire thing, which is NCMR11. Um, and uh, I'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, if anybody wants to tweet at Carly Carioli, that's me. Um, I'll get a little ding. Um, great. So um, let's tell you who we have up here. Um, we have a pretty fascinating cross-section of the Boston media ecosystem. Um, I'll start sort of towards, down towards the end. I had these, I, I, wrote, the, I wrote all this stuff because I'm, I'm not Cali Crossley. I can't do this on demand. Um, the family-owned newspaper is, is a bit of a dying breed, and uh, I say that as somebody who works for a, a family-owned paper myself, but um, uh, at the newspaper I work at, I'm not a member of the family, but, um, but Bill Forey is. Uh, he's the managing editor of the Reporter Newspapers. Uh, which includes the Dorchester Reporter, uh, which was founded by his parents in 1983. It's um, a family newspaper as an outlet for, for independent community journalism, um, but it's also the family newspaper uh, as ethnic press. He also manages the Boston Irish Reporter and the Boston Haitian Reporter, among others, um, and we'll get him to talk about those. Um, his wife, Linda, is the state rep from Dorchester. Um, uh, so quick question, Bill, in 140 characters or less, which is harder, uh, working for your parents or reporting on your wife? <laughs> I'm not even. I, I, I don't think I should dignify that with an answer. Um, I 140. Get out my iPhone and do this. Yes. Um, I think I don't report on my wife, um, but it's definitely harder to, to to live with a politician than to cover one. So yeah. <laughs> that's that's the truth. Good enough. Um, next to Bill, uh, Marcella Garcia comes to the ethnic press from a slightly different path. Um, she's an immigrant herself. She's the editor of El Planeta, which is Boston's Spanish language weekly. Um, she grew up in Monterey, Mexico and studied economics, um, but she landed a job in Mexico working as an assistant to a, uh, a Mexico-based correspondent for the Dallas Morning News. And um, she moved to Boston to get her master's in journalism from Harvard Extension, um, and she joined El Planeta in 2005 as an intern. Um, a little background on El Planeta. It was founded, um, I think, the year before, 2004, by um, Venezuelan immigrants um, with the idea of doing a, a Spanish-language version of almost like a metro-style um, commuter, commuter daily. It's, it's now more, almost more of an alternative weekly. Um, and for full disclosure, the Phoenix bought um, uh, El Planeta in 2008. Um, they are it, 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 almost entirely separate editorial operations. Um, uh, so, Marcella, for you, 140 characters or less, what's the worst part about being owned by the Phoenix? <laughs> the worst part? Yeah. Um, oh, that's a tough one. Um, not being able to, to have, because of language, my newspaper's in Spanish, by the way, and we're the only, we're the only, um, product of the Phoenix that's in Spanish. So it's very frustrating not to be able to have full access to the Phoenix resources because of the Spanish language constraint. 
Also, the food. The food is terrible. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, <laughs> Uh, Kelly Crossley, if you're from Boston, needs no introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway. She should probably be moderating this panel because <laughs> she's much better at this than me. Um, in addition to um, being the host of the Kelly Crossley Show, airs daily on WGBH, um, she's an Emmy winning, yep. Oscar nominated, yep. <laughs> broadcast legend, yep. um, dating back to her uh, days as a producer for ABC's 2020 and, of course, her, her um, work on Eyes on the Prize. Um, she's a frequent guest on both Beat the Press and... Um, the local Fox affiliate, which is quite a, quite a feat. And, um, and in her spare time, she's a wine blogger. That's W-I-N-E, um, which, you can, <laughs> which you can read by Googling the crushed grape report. So Callie, in 140 characters or less, what are we drinking tonight? What are we drinking tonight? Um, hmm. Well, um, I'm very into white burgundy going into Easter. You know, right. I'm a white burgundy girl, you know. That'll work. We can do that. Okay. I think, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a yes to everybody. Um, jumping back down the table. These are, we have so many people on this panel. I didn't think that the introductions were going to take this long. Um, at a time when um, a lot of us um, who are uh, technically for-profit are feeling more like non-profits, um, we're all sort of looking um, uh, to public media for, for um, interesting ideas. And um, uh, Charlie Kravitz is the general manager of WBUR. Um, the NPR affiliate that's owned by um, Boston University. Um, but he's only been there for a few months. Um, he comes to public radio via um, a very distinguished career in television news, first at um, Channel 5 and then a, a long career at New England Cable News. Um, so Charlie has a unique vantage point on uh, broadcast media in Boston, um, and we're going to have him talk about hopefully both, both sides of that. Uh, Charlie, in 140 characters or less... What's your favorite song by the band TV on the radio? <laughs> Just say Wolf Like Me. Wolf Like Me. Good choice. Um, all right, finally, <laughs> uh, the, 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 king of the, jun- the king of the jungle, uh, the dinosaur of the group, uh, the Boston Globe. Um, Excuse me? <laughs> but, I'll, I'll take the first part, not the second. Yes. Um, uh, but a, a noble beast, nonetheless. Um, since the mid-1960s, uh, the, uh, the Globe has won something like uh, 19 Pulitzer Prizes? 20. 20. <laughs> but who's counting? But who's, yeah. um, it, it's had its stresses and strains since um, being acquired by the Times, um, had a near-death experience. We'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, I think one of the things that's most impressive about the Globe is its willingness to, um, to innovate. Um, uh, the, the Globe, and one of the, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, it's about to embark upon a strategy that it would rather not refer to as a paywall, but um, we'll find something else to call it, um, which some of us believe is a disaster in the making and others see as a, a simply inevitable um, move if journalism is going to to, uh, to be paid for. Um, uh, so we're going to talk with uh, managing editor Caleb Solomon. Um, he's uh, joined the Globe in 2003 after two decades at the Wall Street Journal, um, who have uh, uh, done a pretty good job of figuring out how to, how to pay for journalism. So, um, uh, and at the Globe, before becoming managing editor, he edited the business section. Um, it's a pleasure to have him. And Caleb, as far as I can tell, you are the only person on the panel who does not have a Twitter account. True fact. So you don't get to answer in 140 characters. You get the first real question. <laughs> um, let's talk about um, at, uh, the paywall and access. So the, uh, the Globe, um, I, I've, uh, I'm on record as saying I think the Globe has, um, in Boston.com, the finest um, city.com site probably in, in the country and maybe in the world. It does two things really, really well. Um, the, 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 as a journalism site, um, it's a great newspaper site. Most cities don't have a newspaper site that is also a great community site. Um, the plan for the Globe, um, I believe this summer, Caleb can talk a little bit more about details, is to split up. Um, the newspaper will go to bostonglobe.com. It's finest journalism. Um, goes behind a paywall or a pay service. Um, and then they leave the cheap stuff out in the stoop um, on boston.com for free. Um, from the perspective of readers in Boston, who wins in that scenario and who loses? If, if it works, which I think it, there's a pretty good chance it'll work in some form, uh, everybody, I hope, wins. I mean, our, our goal is to have a bostonglobe.com 
digital site that's connected to the newspaper that sort of captures all of our great journalism. It's for people who want, we call it an immersive reading experience who want, in today's language, a curated experience, who want us to pick and choose what they think, what we think that they should know about in the world today. It's going to have sort of fabulous photos. It'll display all of our great journalism. Um, and we think that's a site that's going to grow. We, we know that, you know, something like on the order of a million people read the paper each week. We think there's a tremendous market for that, and we think there's a tremendous market for people who want the paper in some sort of digital version of it in combination. At the same time, if it works, we think that by focusing what you described, and thank you for all the nice words about Boston.com, focusing even more on the community portal city site component of it, engaging community even more than we already do, that we have potential for growing in that direction as well. So if it works, both audiences will grow. Um, Bill, I, I, one of the things that I, I think may happen here is that um, one of the winners, I think, is is everybody else, once their stuff goes behind a paywall. What do you think? I don't know. I, I don't know about that. Um, I think, you know, we're all waiting to see how this is going to work out. And we've been waiting for years to see if the whether it's the Times or the Globe, um, same company, obviously, but the, you know, waiting for the kind of the, the whale to, to make this move. So can I interject? Can sure. we, we have back yeah. and forth? Absolutely. Would that make sense? Yeah. So... Um, uh, much of what the Boston Globe does each day will be on bostonglobe.com. A lot of what the Boston Globe do does will still be on boston.com. So all of our sports coverage will still be on boston.com because sports is such a competitive piece of the Boston marketplace, as everybody here knows. So to put that in a place where it has to be paid for separately doesn't make sense to us. In addition, we will have on boston.com all of the blogs that we are currently doing that are pretty fabulous. All of the breaking news of the day will be on boston.com. There are about 60, actually 70-some-odd blogs that we do, all kinds of verticals, all kinds of things, everything from politics out of Washington to arts and entertainment uh, to the names blog, a whole host of stuff that currently, because boston.com is, is so rich, it's hard to find them. So by surfacing all of these other blogs that we're already doing that are pretty high quality, also by Globe staff, we think that we're going to... It's not like it's going to be an empty vessel. It's actually going to give people an opportunity to see a whole pile of Globe work that they don't currently see. I, I, I um, told myself at the beginning of this I didn't want to turn this into a referendum on Boston.com. Thank you. However, <laughs> but, um, there's one thing that I don't understand about the Boston Globe strategy, and it's this. Right now you have Boston.com, which is a great site that has really high-quality journalism and also all the community stuff. You put the high-quality journalism behind a paywall. And what you attempt to do, it seems, with Boston.com is replace the high-quality journalism with a bunch of free stuff so people sort of don't notice the journalism's gone. Um, and what I don't get is how the Globe thinks about Trans, like getting the the people who are sort of on Boston.com getting the free stuff and sort of turning those people into paid subscribers, which is, I think, one of the geniuses of, of public radio is how they sort of do this thing that walks you along from being a, um, from a free consumer and, and encouraging you to become a, a paid supporter. Um, and and I, I, the, the, the worry that I would have, um, just as somebody who cares about journalism, is that um, the switcheroo that is sort of happening there is kind of um, almost like a bait and switch where you're not quite sure um, if, if it fails. Um, isn't that going to hurt the revenue for paid high-end you know, high journalism at the Globe? I mean, isn't that going to be what, you know, there's not going to be any web revenue coming in from that? Um, there are a couple of questions in there, and we, I don't want to sort of okay. take the whole thing. But sure. so, and I'd, I, we, I could spend an hour, and that would be inappropriate here to sort of talk about the very what we're aiming for on one one of the sites versus the other. Um, the a lot of people have a lot of different appetites, so a lot of people absolutely come to the new Boston.com for news. What we found though is there's a select a large number of them who come to read pretty much what the Boston Globe stories are that day. So we th and they go and they don't look at all the other stuff on Boston.com. That's why we think we have an opportunity on BostonGlobe.com to satisfy those readers. There are a lot of people who come to Boston.com for the city stuff, the arts, the entertainment, but who absolutely want the news, 
but they want the headline and a sentence or two. They don't want 800 words. They don't want to spend five minutes on a story and also to look at the video and also to look at the photos and everything with it. So by having the Boston Globe headline still on boston.com, we think that satisfies a lot of people. If they want more, they can go to bostonglobe.com. Uh, at the same time, they're going to be, at, in addition to sports, they're going to be five stories a day, sort of our biggest stories of the day coming from the Globe, will also be on boston.com. So if we come out with a spotlight story that we think is important, that they, we think everybody should see and everybody will know about, that will probably be one of the five stories each day. So I think we're gonna, if we can pull it off, and believe me, we have, you know, I lose sleep on um, all of the many things that could go wrong, but on all of the many things we might have to adjust once we launch these two things together. Um, but we think that there's going to be a significant amount of globe presence and globe journalism on both sites. And it's more than just the content. It's, it's hard to describe without sort of showing all of the, what it's going to start to look like. Imagine a site that's bostonglobe.com that has a lot fewer links on it, that displays the photos and the videos in much bigger, simpler, call it a more relaxing ways, that more resembles the newspaper. Imagine a site that doesn't have pop-up ads, pop-under ads, little snowflakes flying all over the place, um, all that stuff that tends to bother people who actually want to read stories each day and look at, fo look at photos. So it's, it's the delivery, it's the format as well is completely different, and we think that appeals to a different audience. Anyway, I don't want to no, that's good. hog this um, either. You know, and, and Caleb's got a point. Um, the biggest question for all of us is how the hell are we going to pay for any of this? Um, Charlie, you're, you're in a bit of a different boat, um, but let's talk about um, a little bit about revenue for, for WBUR. Um, you may, it's a nonprofit, but um, there are two sort of potential problems. One, um, there's a, a major, another major public radio competitor across the dial, and two, um, the Republicans really wanted to fund public radio. It's something we talked about a little bit the other day. Um, so let's take those one at a time. Uh, you know, I, I don't have my... my um, alerts on, so I don't know if there's a government shutdown or not, but um, among, one of the things they're fighting over, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood, NPR, um, what, how do you think this is, how do you think that's going to play out? What do you, what do you think, and, and what would be the impact if, if, um, if there was a defunding? Uh, I don't think, I know how it's going to play out. <laughs> I think uh, no one knows. Um, I uh, if I were a betting man, I would say that there's a reasonable chance that w nothing will happen because uh, I think the president uh, has gone on record saying he would not agree to a cut in CPB funding. But um, there's also a chance <coughs> in the process of a compromise that they might, um, as, as the term is being used, give us a haircut. Um, but not chop off our heads. Um, there's a there's a very big uh, kind of robust conversation going on inside of public media right now about uh, federal funding and whether or not uh, there are some people who argue that uh, uh, covering the government when you're getting money from the government, which was always uh, a bit of a devil's bargain, is is now turning into an untenable situation and that perhaps uh, we would be better off without federal funding. I think you have to separate uh, public radio from public television. Uh, public television is less journalistic and more of a kind of a cultural or organization and um, in many ways is more dependent upon CPB funding and federal grants uh, national public radio and public, the whole kind of public radio network uh, gets about $90 million a year from the federal government. It's not a figure that's so daunting that the idea of trying to find other ways to make up for that or part of that um, uh, is, does not seem impossible. I'm new to this world, uh, so I find it fascinating. Uh, part of me thinks... Um, that perhaps a, a, a major, uh, the development of a trust for public radio that could um, make up for that money would be good. Um, but living without it, it frankly, is uh, it, the public radio network is a little like, you know, a scarf. You pull, you pull one thread and the whole thing could fall apart. Um, WBUR, for instance, which distributes four national programs, um, gets one, uh, 6 percent of its 
budget from public funds. Uh, it's $1.3 million. It's not um, a, a figure so impossible that we couldn't somehow cope with it. But um, there are other stations around the country, scores of them, that get a lot more of their uh, uh, budget from federal funds. And they have the potential to go out of business. And that would be, I think, uh, very troubling. And also, they many of them buy our programming. So in addition to our, losing our federal funds, they might other stations may not have the money to... Uh, by our programming, which could have an additional impact on us. So, you know, there's there's a there's a, a big a big debate. There's also a debate about whether um, public radio is biased, and you know that's really at the at the center of the whole federal uh, funding uh, debate. And um, you know that's a whole other topic of conversation. Well, we're among friends. This is all just you know. <laughs> Um, you can you can admit now you're one of us, right? <laughs> okay, okay, just making sure. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So in 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 the the winter of 2009, December 2009, um, WGBH sort of switches formats. Um, Callie, um, can you talk about um, the impact from from the from the WGBH side and uh, sort of walk us through sort of um, a year later what that looks like and what it feels like. Well, originally, WG, this is radio now, the, uh, on the radio, there was a mix of national NPR programming and music, and a lot of classical music. And you may know that in other cities, for example, Washington is the biggest one I can think about, there was at one point a move to get rid of the classical uh, programming and replace it with news and talk. That was a WETA, and that lasted for 10 months. And then they went back to classical programming, and all those people lost their jobs. It was quite ugly. Uh, so when GBH proposed this, I thought, okay, that's not, you know, I don't know if that's going to work. Um, but what WGBH did instead was buy another station, 99.5, which is all classical, move all of the classical programming that had been on GBH over to 99.5. This was not easy, by the way. There were huge, loud, vociferous, angry uh, classical music fans. The WGBH signal is very, very strong. Um, we are heard all over Rhode Island, for example, into Maine, um, New Hampshire. We just we have a very strong signal. So these are people who did not want to. The, the 99.5 signal is a little bit just not as strong. I'll so, interject one quick yeah. thing. I mean, I was at that protest at, I think it was Old South Church. Oh. And I've never seen, um, uh, as somebody who publishes a lot of classical music criticism, you don't ordinarily see a bunch of angry classical music fans. You would not believe. I mean, we're talking about hours, people standing in line. There were hundreds of them, and they just sat there and and um, ranted, yeah. ranted yeah. for hours. I mean, I think it's, I think we may have published. I, there, there's an MP3 somewhere of this. It's unbelievable. Go go dig it up. Yeah. So that was what they what the station was up against. But they felt that the. The programming needed some rejiggering and some revitalization, so they thought this was the best way to go. And I guess the market survey showed that people are interested in more uh, news and talk. And, the, and one of the things that uh, the station decided to go with was local, two local programs, of which I host one of them, and Emily Rooney hosts the other one. And the idea was that we, that we carried national NPR programming. We didn't have any local programming, really. Uh, on the music side, yes, Eric in the Evening is you know, known far and wide. He does fabulous jazz program and some other local programs musically, but not, not uh, news and talk. So there was a switch, much hate, much hate. And <laughs> we switched over, and it was ugly. Uh, January of, uh, t of 2010, <clears throat> and just sort of went at it. Um, uh, I don't mind sharing with you because now it seems ridiculous that I would take this job after this guy, the guy said to me, but the person who was interviewing me uh, for the gig said, I said, well, God, this is happening really fast. I mean, people spend a year prepping to get ready to change and do anything. He says, eh, whatever. Look, you're on. You'll be bad for a while. Then you'll be better. <laughs> I thought, yeah, but it's me bad for a while. <laughs> anyway, so I, hopefully I wasn't that horrible at the beginning, and, you know, here we are today. Um, it's been a hard slog uh, trying to just get used to the rhythm of a daily show. There's a lot going into it. And by the way, these are shows that are not, um, and I'm speaking for mine now, that are not uh, just sort of go to the mic and 
talk about whatever's on top of your head. So these are research shows where we have defined topics, so I have to do homework, a lot of it, uh, every day to keep up with that. There was also a switch. My producer and I both came from national programming. So we had to get our heads out of national programming into local programming, and we have really gone deep on that, and I'm very proud of that. So it's very easy to localize a national story, and we've tried to go beyond that and really uh, get the story, the local stories that are organically local, not localized from national. And that's a tougher thing to do, and we work very hard to do it. And uh, in addition to that, I decided that if I ever had an opportunity to actually be at the, at the head of a program, the number one thing I was going to do was that I was going to have a variety of voices. Okay, let's, let, me, let me repeat that. A variety of voices. And I say that because people say it all the time. Oh, they say it all the time. Oh, we're having a variety of voices. It's the same three people around and around and around in a circle. And I was bound and determined that that was not going to happen. So we have searched far, wide, everywhere we can to get voices you do not hear any place else, and I'm extremely proud of that. Um, I have some great contributors in the room now. One just came in. Two of my contributors are sitting here. We wanted to go hyper-local, uh, a mix of voices, and that's across the board, um, uh, racially, ethnically, um, gender-wise, and I'm really proud of that. I, I want uh, to serve Carly, yeah. can I... <laughs> Go ahead. I don't want to get into a uh, public radio you can spat. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, public radio but, spat. Yeah, yeah, I know it's you want me to, but <laughs> I don't. Uh, but I, it needs to be said that uh, just so, just so that everybody here un understands that the the anger that was uh, generated around WGBH's move was not uh, exclusively about uh, people who love classical music and their signal was weaker and certain people couldn't hear it. Um, this is the only market in America where two major full power FM stations have the same format. Um, and there's good reason for that. Uh, you know, WBUR is an iconic station and has worked now for 25 or 30 years uh, to develop a, a following and, um, and a quality collection of programs. And GBH's decision to, uh, to basically dump the hybrid uh, music and news uh, um, format and take uh, the format that, frankly, BUR pioneered decades ago um, was considered by many people to be uh, a, a very aggressive and um, a perhaps destructive move. My, my concern, and I'm new to this, as I've said, but my concern is, and the people who preceded me, is that um, instead of having really won the station with the resources to be really one of the great public radio stations in America, uh, this sort of uh, competition could result in two um, stations that are uh, significantly less um, uh, powerful with fewer resources to do the kind of work that uh, we'd all like to do. There's all sorts of good arguments, I guess, on the other side that competition is good and that we have two hours of additional local um, programming on WGBH. Um, but uh, that the, the, the premise of this move was a belief, and I guess some research that GBH did, that suggested that uh, by getting into this format, their ratings, which were not terribly strong, would grow, and that uh, the whole marketplace for public radio listening would grow. I think the chances of that actually happening are pretty slim. I think the reality is that this is probably, relatively speaking, a zero-sum game, and if they were to gain, it would probably come out of WBUR's uh, audience. Um, and um, uh, it's obviously my job to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, so let me give you both a compliment and then add something. Actually, the numbers have gone, um, well, they didn't have any else, place else to go, but up at WGBH in terms of regular uh, listeners. And that, I believe, is because we increased the pie itself. We didn't take from the pie, we increased it. And also, here's a compliment. There was one 
hour of local radio in Boston on BUR. It was Radio Boston, a very fine show. And it is now five days a week because when we came on, the competition responded by making that show five days a week. So what you have now, uh, if you're a listener, is an opportunity to hear a very fine host on BUR. I love Meghna Chakrabarty and uh, Anthony Brooks is great. Got nothing but love for them. Um, and over on our side, there's me. Um, with my particular focus and, uh, I think, different voice, and then there's Emily. So, and in fact, they're in terms of local news and information, and I believe, and just piggybacking off of what Caleb said, and actually Bill and Marcella, there is more and more interest in what is happening locally. People want to know, and not just the surface stuff, and so we've all talked about opportunities to expand that news and information. What's been amazing to me, shouldn't have been, but... Boston and the surrounding areas, and we define Boston regionally, is that there is so much stuff going on, and some of it never got covered because there wasn't space for it. Right. But now there's space right. for it. So I, you, you may be right um, at some point down the road when we're talking about this money being cut, because that's very serious, and he's very correct about that. But in terms of the competition making both the products better, I have to say I disagree. I think the products are much stronger today than they would have been before GBH made the switch. Well, let me just <laughs> – I, I don't want to go uh, – uh, uh, you know, completely occupy this, this panel. One more but, uh, just, uh, just as a response to that, um, you know, the issue of whether uh, BUR planned to go to five days a week with Radio Boston or not or whether there was a response to GBH is a whole other matter. But – um, you know, the, the reality is at the moment, and I'm not afraid to share this, it's public knowledge, that your ratings, which, as you said, really had only up to go, uh, have gone up uh, a little bit. Um, and our ratings, uh, which were very large, have gone down a bit, which I think uh, suggests that um, it is probably a zero-sum game. And the question then becomes when we're all struggling around not just the... Uh, content and the uh, amount of programming, the kind of programming that we all, all like to do, but whether we have the resources to do those programs in the future and do them well, if indeed we're taking money and shifting it from one, one station to the other and support from one station to the other, can a marketplace this size support two public radio stations that are basically uh, competing head to head and in many places carrying the same programming at the same time? Um, and I think the, the question is that that's still uh, up in the air yet, what the results will be. C can I throw in a complication to all of this that probably everybody in this room is familiar with? I mean, so you guys are talking about just the radio component of what you do. So BUR in the last, BUR has probably had a website for a long time, but in the past year or two, Charlie, yep. they've really ramped it up. I'd like to think we have a website that's pretty important in, in, in the greater Boston area. So how we all work, I mean, and work with each other, I mean, we have partnerships with BUR, probably with GBH as well in various ways, as well as compete head on. In today's world, it's really complex how you compete and who you're competing in and what um, medium. So BUR's website is something we at, Boston, at the Boston Globe with Boston.com and our plans to launch a new website really pay a lot of attention to because they're suddenly... Uh, putting some more enterprise out there. They're doing, uh, they're not just putting the radio out there, they're putting stories out there in a different way. So it all gets really complicated how we're all competing in today's world. Can I just say something, Carly? Yeah. Um, so Car um, Callie was saying about having <clears throat> diverse voices and everything, and I think <clears throat> all, what you guys are all saying is that the audience problem, the audiences are becoming more complex and, and complex because the face of um, you know, Massachusetts and Boston is changing. So what Charlie is saying about the pie getting, you know, being a zero-sum game, it really isn't. I mean, when you look at uh, your audience, you have to go beyond what your regular listeners have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you just look at the census numbers, and, and I'm sorry for throwing this out. Because yeah, it, it, I actually it, it wanted to like, talk about this a little bit. And, and there's a me. quote, um, this is something that Marcella wrote, um, actually, in the Phoenix, but also it was in El Planeta um, a couple of weeks ago. The 2010 census numbers came back a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, so here's, here's the number. Um, Hispanic and Asian populations, and this is Massachusetts, grew by 46% each in the last decade. Um, thus, downtown Framingham has become Little Brazil. Lowell and Lynn are, both have thriving Cambodian communities. And East Boston is now a, uh, a Colombian and Central American haven. In fact, um, Massachusetts' nearly one million immigrants rank at seventh in the nation in the number of foreign-born residents 
Um, and many of these new Bay Staters don't speak English when, when they get here. Um, so uh, what, one, of the, one of the questions is tell us a little bit about your, about your audience, which has some interesting um, pieces to it. Um, and, and then um, f well, I want to follow up and talk about how that changes between print and online and why. Well, this is also what Kelly was saying. This is hyper local. The, my audiences cannot get you know more any more local. This, these are recent immigrants. These are the people that are basically making the state grow, you know, by the census numbers. They all speak Spanish, and um, uh, you know, some of them are a little proficient in English. Some of them are not. I mean, if you look at the, for, for example, the Boston Public Schools, uh, the, the children, Latino children, are very close to becoming a majority within the Boston public school system, and that's just looking at one institution. I mean, if you go uh, to any other, it, the, 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 it probably reflects the same thing. So, you know, when you talk about audiences, um, they're very segmented now. And again, not even going into web and print and, and whatever, we're only talking about ethnicity. So one of the things that Kelly has done, obviously, is giving us a voice to, and by that, giving all these people that, the, you know, they, they basically, are not covered in the news because it, it, you know they're not mainstream at all. I mean, a lot of the stories that I covered are not covered by the Globe or you know the Herald, let alone the Herald. I'll let you go on, but I'll disagree with that. And ahead. I will disagree with what you're going to say, I'm sure. So. <laughs> but uh, well, I mean, it, it all comes back to being to having a diverse staff, and and you can talk about a newsroom being diverse, but when you have the people at the top, the editors making the decisions. And this is what I mean by not you know, having not having these stories covered. The editors are the ones that are making the decisions. And if you don't have a diverse, you know, body of editors, we, we do. How I'm many sorry, Latino I, I, editors I, I, I do you have? I hate to interrupt, but but how many you, you Latino should, you, editors? Can, can do you I have? just suggest you make your case, but don't make it as me as against us? No, I Cause, mean, cause, I, I mean, we you, wrote about all the census stuff probably before you did. We have Peter Schwarm writing about all of the new census information. But that's not We've what I'm talking about. about. That's not what I'm and, talking well, about. I mean, just as the starting point, we have 51 hyper-local sites, including most of the communities you cover. So I, I, I just don't think you should make your case against I'm not me. I think making you should your... talk about what you do, because we do it pretty darn well. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry if I offended you, but the numbers speak by themselves. And you don't have a Latino editor, and that really... It really affects the way you cover Latino stories. Well, I think there's Period. there's probably a, there's a couple of different issues that we might want to unpack there. Um, I did want to actually come down to, to Bill on this because one of, uh, what we're trying to address here is is, is diversity, but there's yeah. two kinds of diversity: the, the coverage, and then there's right. also the, the, the people who are, who are doing it. Sure, and I think that there is a difference there, and and I, I would have to disagree slightly with Caleb. Um, just because you know it's not so much about the um, the capacity to cover these communities; it's just that. Um, you know, the Globe is not an ethnic paper, um, and a, a paper like El Planeta or the Boston Haitian Reporter or the Irish Reporter, for that matter, you know, we're very niche focused on covering these communities, and so I, I'm not, I'm not going to harangue the Globe for not covering, you know, the Haitian Multi Service Center uh, I, monthly I, I, meeting. You I, know, I guess, but we have a, we have a full time immigration reporter. Maria Sacchetti, who's multilingual, who writes amazing stories about Absolutely. all of these communities. No, no question we have a Your Town site for Dorchester uh, yeah. that does stuff based on our own work and of aggregates course. the great stuff yeah. other people do. Right. I, I, I just don't know that I would... I, think I, I don't mean to be sensitive defensive. about it. No, yeah. well, you are because I, I think you should make your case, but not, not oh, because there's to... some big gap with what we do. I didn't suggest there's a big gap. I said that that's not the business you're in. You're not in the business of covering the Haitian community every day. Maria Sacchetti is a great reporter. She's done fabulous work. Your coverage of the Haitian earthquake was tremendous. But the Boston Haitian community exists every day, and that's why we exist, to cover them every day. And it's the same with the Irish community and other ethnic papers in our niche. And the Your Town sites, as terrific as they are, are, are relatively new. They're going through some growing pains. I think that there's a lot of promise there. And you know, to the, it's kind of a corollary there with the, the public radio um, um, battle, I guess. I think it's a friendly rivalry. Um, I considered it that with the Your Town site. So when, when Dorchester popped on the scene for the Globe um, with a hyper-local site, I was pleased about it. Because first of all, it does raise the profile of our stories, um, drive some traffic our way, but it's also better for the community to have more reporters flood in the zone. And that's something that hadn't been happening prior to the Your Town sites in the way that it probably should have. And I realize it's a, it's a change in a business model across the industry to go local. But I don't think it's really the case, and I don't think um, Marcella is making the case that the Globe 
uh, is deficient. It's just not the business you're in to be a daily uh, um, reporting on, on a very small slice of the community. If I could just add um, uh, one of the features that I have every week on my show today. Um, when I do my local week in review, I do not uh, go from the mainstream papers. So my local week in review, I, and we were totally trying to figure out a way, because as you know, most radio programs do a sort of wrap up at the end of the week, and so you probably heard one if you listen to public radio. You know, Diane Reams is a national thing. Lots of other people do a national thing or some mix. I don't do that. My week in review is hyper-local. So I go to alternative presses, to ethnic press, to online sites that are telling me, as we say in our promo, the stories before they become mainstream. So what I would say, Caleb, is that, uh, you know, Maria is great, but half the time I've discussed those stories before she gets them. And that's because these people are talking about them first. And that isn't, no, no, it's, it's no, there's no offense against her. It's not, a, you're taking it at the fence, it's not. It's just to say that there's a different thing going on here. And so to that extent, that's what I mean about, you know, focusing on in a very narrow niche way that goes, that not only goes wide, but goes deep uh, in those communities. And so for me to have the voices of those people who are writing about that in the way that Bill has said, totally, you know, just totally, that's all they do, um, is, is a t completely different weekend review. And I've gotten a lot of comments about that. So I just want to put that on the table. And, and this, she's great. You know, nobody's saying she's not great. Well, but, 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 but we're saying, you know. I mean, I, I guess, and she is great. She's and great. we're kind of saying that she reads the local press and then redoes no, somebody no, else's story. That. Well, you said, you see, yeah, you just, well, but, you, but you said half of her stuff appears elsewhere no, before no, no. it runs. I did not say half her stuff. I said, let me be clear. I, I think Maria's great. Maria, wherever you are, fabulous. She's what I'm saying. Oh, thank you. Okay. But I never met the woman. I'm saying that in the discussion that I have with my contributors in my hyper local week in review, which taps into small papers, online presses, um, and hyper local other sites, we do those stories long before they show up on Main Street Press. It happens all the time. So by the time I see something in a large way, it's like, oh, we talked about that three weeks ago. And yeah, that's okay. And, and that's a result <laughs> of us, like yeah, Bill and you said, us being a niche newspaper. And for full disclosure, I'm very good friends with Maria Sacchetti, actually. We speak every day on the phone, and you would not believe this. She reads my Who's paper. better friends with Maria Now we have to give her a raise, right? <laughs> No, I'm serious. We, we talk about it all the time. I, no, I, I take your point fully. It just, um, I take your point fully. And to, to pretend that we do absolutely every freaking story under the sun would be preposterous. And, and that there's lots of good stuff that come elsewhere that bubbles up in a different way. What, I think what we're seeing here is, is exactly how, how, um, how competitive it is. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to talk to, to Bill about is just sort of about how you guys think about you're, I mean, how at the at the neighborhood paper level, how you deal? It, there's we we now have it's not just the Globe, um, it's not just your town, it's yeah. it's Patch, it's whoever else yeah. is coming in, is coming in. Well, well, first of all, as competitive as it is, I, I think we'd leave the wrong impression to say that there's like great acrimony here. I mean, look, um, the Boston Globe, we we have great friends there, we 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 admire the Globe. Um, the former managing editor of the Globe is my associate editor at the Reporter, Tom Mulvoy. Uh, Steve Kirkjian, who won three Pulitzers with the Globe, is in our newsroom now, as a you know, working through Walter Robinson's project at Northeastern. So there's great synergies throughout throughout this ecosystem, as you described it. Obviously, with Cali um, and, and and the Reporter, we do a lot with Cali. Uh, I partnered with El Planeta early on with uh, the Ethnic Media Project, and we've been on BUR, and we it's just so such cr cross pollination going on that that's a good thing. And like I said, at the bottom line for me, what the, this has all been good for the, sit, for the city, yep. okay, for the city neighborhoods. Um, and I realize this, the sustainability issue here, here is, you know, it's, it's beyond me, frankly. But um, in the near term, in, in, in the past year or two, this has been a huge uh, uplift for, for our communities. We're getting, um, and, and the, the piece of that pie that I just alluded to is the, is the universities stepping in Boston University and Northeastern in particular, um, with investigative journalism yeah, let's talk outfits about that, a bit. that, that uh, one of which has partnered with us, the, the yeah. Walter Robinson's group at Northeastern, and we've run um, eight or eight or nine packages now that have been 
produced with Steve Kirkjian um, and with other with co-op students from Northeastern who are fabulous. Yeah, let me just set this up a little bit. I mean, you know, to sort of switch 180 degrees and look at at the collaboration that's going on. And this is, I think, something that's happening across the board, big and small. Um, I know the Globe's involved in it as well. Um, and you know, I think the the you know the the driver here is is again it's 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 finances and and trying to do more with less, um, and also the rise of these sort of nonprofit journalism um, um, institutes at, at universities. Some of them are just plain old nonprofits. Um, but why, why don't you sort of walk us through a little bit how you ended up with with Walter Robinson's group? Well, I, it again it com- comes to the door of Tom Mulvoy, former edit- editor at the Globe, and, and being in our shop and having that relationship with uh, Walter Robinson, who many of you will know that name um, immediately. And um, Walter came to us about a year and a half ago and said, "Listen, I have this new uh, investigative journalism department. They've done great work with the Globe already, but they wanted to take it to a local level, to a neighborhood level, and um, and work with us and see." And they went out and got a grant from the Knight Foundation. Um, they got a grant from another uh, um, journalism program, which I should know, and I, I, I should have written that one down. Um, and, uh, and we said, of course. I mean, th- this was huge for us. This was something where we could do, uh, we could dedicate reporters for six or seven weeks on one topic. Um, so it, it's, it's been ongoing since last summer, and, and we hope it'll go on for another year at least. And I think this is going to be uh, replicated at other community newspapers. I hope, and ethnic papers as well. Yeah, and and one of the one of the other sort of you know odd things about about that sort of I, well, why don't you talk a, a little bit? Maybe Caleb can talk a little bit about um, the the BU version of that, which um, you guys share. So, yeah. so the stories are shared by uh, there's a consortium that publishes those stories. It's both the Globe and El Planeta, and I think some other. Yeah, people. I mean, there's a whole. Do you want to grab one? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole. There's a whole pile of stuff in the ecosystem right now with working with local schools. I mean, the Northeastern effort, the BU effort. I mean, we all, for us, and I, it's, it's, uh, it's an experiment that's worked out really well. I mean, we've sort of worked with uh, trusted editors like Robbie or trusted people at um, BU, and the classes do end up doing spending time. They learn how to do journalism, and it's really um, – incredibly rewarding for the likes of us to see that there are still students in journalism school who aspire to do great and ambitious, meaningful work. So uh, we give them an outlet, out, an outlet for publication of the stuff they've done. And some of it's been fabulous. I mean, it's been stuff we've put on the, we've put on the front page, highlighted in ways, um, watchdog journalism, good old-fashioned stuff where the story runs and then, you know, there's a huge reaction and good things happen as a result of the story. So for us, particularly with our staff, you know, certainly as everyone here has probably got a smaller staff than they used to three, four, five years ago, to be able to tap into these veins where we, where we have a relationship already and trust the people who are doing it, it's just produced great journalism. And often we do it in partnership with other uh, media organizations. We've done stuff with BUR. I think we've, we've done El Plan- we, we work with no, you guys through the BUR, through the BUR uh, program. Center. Yeah, and you know, there's a certain complication to sort of coordinating the publication of one thing in multimedia with five or six organizations, but we've managed to pull it off and with a lot of success, and that just sort of raises the uh, opportunity for the students and the journalism programs to do even more because it gives them broad outlets, it gives them the exposure, and they can have the impact that they might not otherwise have. And for us, it just you know, gives our readers great stories that they wouldn't otherwise have. If I could add, and people are throwing around some names, and you should know, Walter Robinson is like an icon of investigative journalism. He was at the Globe for a long time, led the Spotlight team, did the, um, and then Maggie Mulvihill is with BU Joe and Joe Bergantino. I mean, these are really solid uh, investigative reporters. Uh, Maggie's a Neiman alum. Uh, you know, just just so you know who the students are working with. Next question. We ready? Yeah. All right. Good. Um, uh, there's in talking a, a little bit about um, I wanted to, to go back to w- to one more thing that I, I think will be div- divisive and this will be the last one um, that we started to talk about the store the, the story side of diversity about what gets covered um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the diversity in newsrooms um, it, Callie I'm, I'm handing this off to you softball there it goes you don't have to look far it's not much <laughs> um, for on the radio side, uh, I'm the only African-American radio host, I believe, in the region. Uh, if you, you're not counting pirate radio, this is it. You know? <laughs> you know right. You, that's it. Uh, 
Um, but I said host. Is she a host? You consider her a host? You well, consider... she's, she's... she's a news reader. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. No, no, I, I, wow. I'm not saying that. I'm saying oh, hosting man. a show. Yeah. All right, let me be clear. Hosting a show, I believe I'm the only person. Is that correct? Is I, if I'm wrong, that I'm happy to. Okay, that's what I meant by it. I didn't mean any, um, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to, you know, cast aspersions in any way. I just, the only person I know hosting a show is me in this, in this area. Now, there are other people of other ethnicities, but, you know, let's mention, I mentioned Megan Chakrabarty. She's South Asian. So that's important. And according to the census data around here, that's very important um, that we need to pay attention to. But if you look, um, I'm looking TV, I haven't seen much, you know. Uh, not in, There were some, quote, glory days, and then some of those have diminished. Um, it, I will just say this. If any of you have gone other cities and you turn on the television, it's a little bit shocking because you see like a, a mix of people. And here it's, it's the difference. It's, it's, di it's totally different. Yeah. So that's my comment on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just going to talk about us because rather than others, um, I mean, it's hard to diversity both at within our staff and at the tops of our staff is something that's critically important. It's, it's part of our mission uh, to serve our community and we can't serve our community without it. So I could throw out numbers uh, which we monitor really, really closely. Uh, our diversity is exceeds, but the, our newsroom's diversity exceeds greater Boston's population in terms of its diversity by a couple of percentage points, which is sort of the industry standard. The American Society of Newspaper Editors sets that as the goals, meaning if your community is 15% diverse, your newsroom should have a diversity level of at least 15%. So we're at around 20-something percent, 21%, I think, last time I looked, which I'm not sure based on the newest census, but based on the past one, exceeds what our readership in Greater Boston's diversity level is. Uh, on our masthead, we have, you know, we focus on that. We have a variety of people of color, women, uh, making key decisions every day. So we really focus on it. It's and. Um, with the layoffs we've had in the past couple of years, that's been a challenge, and we've been fortunate enough to be able to hire in the past couple of years, past 18 months or so, fill spots and grow. And our focus on sort of not just staying where we are, but improving our diversity, mostly because it helps us do what we do for a living. It helps fulfill our mission. We're really focusing on that and have had a lot of success in the past in some hires that we've had as well. All right. I wanted to add, we're... Um Wanted to sort of leave some time for questions, um, and we can do that in maybe five or ten minutes. Um, one thing we we haven't sort of, we haven't really talked too much about is the television side of this, um, and just wanted to go back to to Charlie and and um, this is the world you just came from, um, and um, wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you came from and your thoughts about um, television news on the on the on the uh, on the broadcast side. I'm sorry, on, on, what do you think of news on the television side? Um, well, I, I think it's, uh, there's been a, a huge transition over the last 20 years. When I first got into television, there was a, uh, what I would describe as a real nobility towards it. Uh, there was a seriousness of purpose. There were long form uh, stories, documentaries. Uh, I think at the height of it, when I was at Channel 5, there were 325 people, I think, who worked at Channel 5. There's probably around 150 now. Um, you can't do that kind of quality journalism if you don't have the resources. Um, now, of course, back then, you know, uh, the, the marketplace was split up among three or four stations. Uh, and now there's hundreds of stations that people can choose from. So some of this is economic. And we actually haven't spent a lot of time in this panel talking about the crisis, the economic crisis, which is driving so much of, of everything that's going on in television, radio, and, and, and all medium. Uh, but, but therefore, for a lot of reasons, uh, local television news has turned into, in my opinion, pretty much a headline service, police blotter news to a large degree, a tabloid sensibility. It, it's very disappointing to me. That's not the kind of news that I... Uh, would like to see, and I think if you look at the demographics and you look at uh, who's watching local television news, that to a large degree, um, the local television stations have lost a very large portion of the population that once relied upon it and watched it uh, um, consistently, almost daily. Um, so, 
you know, in, in one sense it's very sad, in another sense there's a real opportunity. When I started uh, NECN, New England Cable News, in 91, the first person I hired was Iris Adler, who was the uh, news director at WBUR, because I wanted to try and create a 24-hour news channel that had NPR's uh, values journalistically. And I think to a large extent, with a very modest uh, staff uh, at the beginning, which we grew, but we did that. We won, uh, we, we did documentaries, we did long stories, because the one thing we had in abundance was time on a 24-hour news channel. We looked at issues, we had beats, um, and we didn't spend a lot of time chasing car crashes and fires and petty crime. Um, uh, sadly, uh, since Comcast has taken over, they've, they've moved it in another direction. They own it, and they can do whatever they want with it, and they seem to be convinced that that's a direction that will grow the audience. I, I don't happen to share that uh, perspective, but I would say that local television news is in a very different place than it was and probably will not return to um, the kind of quality news that uh, at least I value. And I think that, therefore, there's, a, there's an opportunity in the public media space to jump in and provide that service. I think GBH and BUR are doing that now and, and hopefully will expand those efforts. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the things that I asked you the other day was just, wh you know, what that opportunity looks like and, you know, the, the idea that it would have to come from public media if because the, 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 the market impediments to trying to get for somebody to get in commercially are just um, not Yeah, I mean, you had asked and I, I said no, one, no one's going no one's gonna to buy a tele broadcast station and no one's going to get on cable. Uh, so I think the opportunities are either in public media where there are already existing uh, outlets uh, – that will dive in and hopefully do more high quality journalism and and on the web and in digital form and mobile and all of that where I think there's great untapped opportunity yet to do original content uh, not just taking mainstream media and uh, transplanting it onto the web but uh, creating original journalism for the web and frankly I see a time in the not too distant future in which the web will start driving content back towards the mainstream media where a, a lot of original journalism will happen there and then if it if it's a broad enough interest it will be it will be it will move on to the into the paper it will move into television it'll move into radio yeah and, and I think we've already even locally started to see some of that Joanna Maranova from press Pass TV is here and they've done some some remarkable video stuff that, um, that some of us have, have run uh, can I, Bill, can I yeah. just add to the mix just and this is a hyper local example I realized uh, but Boston's Cable Access Foundation has had a very good um, evening um, news program called Neighborhood Network News since the 1980s. They continue to broadcast, and Chris Lovett, um, pound for pound, I think, is one of the best journalists in the city. And so I worked on that show in college. What's that? I worked on that show in college. There you go. So you know Chris's um, skill set, and, and, and he's been doing this for so long. He's an institution. Um, he's a Dorchester guy originally and has been covering the city since he was a teenager. So I think that's the sort of model that I'd like to see expanded upon at the local level to, to, to buttress what's going on, on online. And I, I agree that out, outfits like Press Pass TV show great promise in, in, uh, um, in, in the model for sure to, to, to train, especially in the training of, of city kids. Of We need to be cultivating more talent out of our neighborhoods um, it's one of the things we try to do, but we need help on that end. So um, I'm pleased that they're on the scene. Um, I also want to – a lot of us, I can, I can tell you at the Phoenix, we've, we've tried doing video. And, again, it's a very different, mostly different kind of video. Um, but the, the, um, it's, uh, economically, it, it doesn't work out for most of us. Um, it, um, and um, one exception to that, I think, is, has definitely been at the Globe. Um, where, and you'll see uh, the, um, across the country a lot of – even bigger uh, media outlets drew back from video over the past 18 months. Um, the globe is sort of going in the opposite direction. You can sort of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, jumping off on something Charlie mentioned, so how many people here in this room watch some sort of TV news to get, get a dose of news? Okay, so it's a, still a decent, not, my guess is not quite five, half. Uh, how much local? So it's a couple. So my guess is five or ten years ago, much of the room would have had their hands up. And how many people watch web video of some kind? during a typical day, right? Yeah, so that's clearly where the direction is going. That's where we're trying to go. It's a lot of, to agree what Charlie said. So um, 
We are focusing tremendously on uh, web video uh, as a tremendous new outlet for us because, I mean, web video that's good is just kind of magical. It's just so cool. And uh, as, as Carly mentioned, so in the past 18 months when, the, when you know, like times got really bad for a lot of news organizations, including us, we, still, we stuck and we've been actually growing and investing in web video capacity. So one of the things we do is all of our photographers, we have 14 photographers, I believe, that roughly uh, work for us. All of them are now have been equipped since last April with uh, equipment, a new camera, Mach 4, that lets them shoot both still photography and also shoot video with the same piece of equipment. So what that means is if a reporter's out with one of our photographers, that same photographer is working with the story with the reporter, shooting photos, and also doing video with it as well that augments that story. So kind of overnight, my sense is, we went from having virtually no presence in video in the streets of Boston to having probably more people shooting news video than anybody else in the city. And my guess is our 14 on any given day exceed the number of crews of Channel 5 or 7 or NECN. At the same time, we have a video crew devoted just to doing video. So our, we focused a lot. We've moved video in a much more significant, easier-to-use place on the homepage of Boston.com. We've filtered video throughout Boston.com in context with other stories. Uh, and our traffic is growing something like 50% year-to-year. And what's also cool, from a, and Carly mentioned that it's a tough uh, sale, and video is expensive, and it's time consuming. We sure have learned that. But the difference is we thought, we, we saw the trends. We just saw what I saw in this room is that people are watching web video, so we thought the investment made sense. So a year ago, we were struggling to convince advertisers to come to us uh, for web video, and now it's the opposite. We have more advertisers lining up who want to buy our web video than we can deliver traffic on any given day, which is a much better place to be. And we're now sort of chasing the dollars I hate you. with our web video. I hate you. <laughs> it's, it's a good place. And, and Charlie's right. So what, what the magic of that is for us is we take the one story and we have the opportunity to leverage it in a variety of different ways. We do it in the paper. We do it on the website with words. We do it uh, visually with photos. And we also do multimedia with uh, web video. And it's sort of, that's the magic. It's kind of, it's, it's a little, it's a glimmer of why we think we're going to thrive again pretty soon. Anyway. Um, if I, could, I just want to add yep. a couple of things. Um, I would be interested to know how many people, when people say they watch web video, so much traffic is uh, from TV, actually, that's posted on the web that people watch on the web. That's my habit. I watch a lot of TV, but on the web. So if it's not really quite web video, how many people are getting watching the TV on the web? See, you know, you, so you can't really say it's a total drive toward web video. Don't get me wrong. I think web video is good when done well. Let me just say the New York Times is web stuff is sucky, except for Mark Bittman. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it, suge it suggests interesting sort of convergences down the road. I mean, yeah, um, and certainly um, there's a lot of money being spent to try and keep um, the web and television separate for the last 20 feet. That's probably going to end pretty soon. Um, you could certainly see. I mean, you get on an airplane and, and you watch. You end up watching Times Web Video on your little screen. So. Yeah, sleep. That stuff is sucky. I, I, I know. How do you watch it? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but thank you for not mentioning our video, which is fabulous yeah, I think and it's cool. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> so imagine the ability to put all of that together. And you know, people are now streaming Netflix on uh, video games. People, there's all sorts of way to get stuff. So imagine. Uh, Boston Globe TV to your boxy or your set-top box or to Apple TV. It's, it's a lot of opportunity out there for us. We're, we're really we, we're excited by video. Um, if there are, if, you, if people have questions, I'm not sure what the, uh, what, are we, what are we doing here? We got a hey, microphone? Carly, can I just say one th more sure. thing about video? Absolutely. Considering I, I spent most of my career in it, um, and, and to, I guess, to kind of uh, second what Car uh, what uh, Callie was just saying, doing, you know, video, just throwing video up is uh, easy, relatively easy to do now. Doing good, interesting, high quality video is really hard. Um, it's, uh, you know, video itself is inherently boring. Uh, it is. I mean, television is inherently boring unless you are very sophisticated in how you produce it and mix it, and, uh, and people undervalue the importance of sound in, uh, in putting together high-quality video. 
So, you know, the challenges are not just to throw up uh, a lot of video that um, maybe people will watch for 15 seconds and get bored and move on, but to do high quality video, um, that's going to take a, a lot of training and a lot of kind of rethinking of news gathering for the web. All right, we'll go to the questions. Thank you. So I'm Joanna Marinova with Press Pass TV, the organization. You guys mentioned a second ago. And I just had a comment and then a question. Um, so I think that when you speak of diversity, to us is as important as it is. It brings relevancy. That's where diversity comes into play. So diversity can also be achieved through community partnerships. And with Press Pass, you know, we let the people speak for themselves. And it's really about building a relationship with the community that I think as big institutions is sometimes difficult. Northeastern was mentioned, and I work with a lot of interns from Northeastern. And overall, as an institution, Northeastern won't even admit that they're in Roxbury. Um, they tell their students, Roxbury is a super dangerous place, don't go there, when essentially they are in Roxbury. So how do you relate back to the community? And as far as... Um, the radio, Touch FM, Callie, you mentioned, you know, um, people of color on the radio. And Touch FM is a huge resource to the community. So I wanted to know from you guys, what are you doing to kind of support community partners and build with them to gain those partnerships and that relevancy? Um, I'll jump in on that, um, Joanna. Thank you. The Touch FM, for one, is, is one of those stations that clearly is – unlicensed and, and is described as a pirate. We've covered them. Uh, the Phoenix this week has a great piece on uh, low-power radio that um, I'd encourage everyone to, to read. And um, it's, you know, I am one of those people who feel that they're, f they're filling a void um, and an important one. And, and that voices, I listen, I used to listen to Touch every morning. I, frankly, I, I, I don't listen as much as I used to because one of their personalities left and when he left it wasn't as good for me. Uh, MC Spice, if you're out there. Um, <laughs> But look, it's 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 an important hyperlocal voice. I mean, when I when I listen to Touch, I hear the voice of Roxbury and Dorchester uh, of the African American community, and in a way, I don't hear it anywhere else on the radio. Um, and I don't mean that as an offense to anybody else in radio. It's just they're in Grove Hall, you know, and they're talking about Grove Hall every day, and they're talking about their kids at the bus stop, and you know the problems they run into going to the grocery store. I mean, that, I mean that's not going to. Um, sell ads, and it's not going to be a, a sustainable model. But for low-power FM, I think it, there's, there's a huge niche there. And in terms of the, um, it, by the way, Northeastern is not the only institution that, that likes to deny where they where they are. I think that that's a problem in the city. Um, and there's a there's a big problem in the city right now with with the city itself, with the BRA not understanding the neighborhoods very well, and it needs to be fixed. Um, but the partnership piece, um, we try to work with it. We we do partner with, uh, um, we've partnered with Touch in the past. And we partner, as I mentioned, with uh, Neighborhood Network News, which I think is an uh, underused resource. There's a ton, a ton of uh, radio done in Spanish out of East Boston, for example. And, and again, talking about the language barrier being, you know, um, it works against their own, um, you know, benefit because it, it is a barrier. And, and I guess, you know, talking about audiences, for example, uh, it's really, really complex to cover communities that are really, that, that first of all, don't speak Spanish, uh, English, for example, and then you talk about Haitians, and you talk about Latinos, and then you talk about African Americans. It's, it's very hard, so without, the, without that um, relationship with, the, you know, with these community partners, you can't really do it. Um, uh, I think you know, the, part of the answer of all this that we've been talking about here um, it, it really is an opportunity to, you know, to look into how diverse Boston has become. And when you talk about diverse, it means different things in different cities. It, it really, I mean, it's one of those words, like I was saying before, that gets thrown out. And, and it really, I mean, the meaning of diverse is, is very different from when you go to East Boston, when you go to Mattapan, when you go to Dorchester. So it is an opportunity. It really is an opportunity. It really blows my, it, it's, it's so mind-blowing to think that you know, there's business to be done there. You know, if you really know how to get to them or cater to them, you know, whether it is in Spanish, whether it is in English, some of them speak English, they do, you know, but, um, you know, I'm talking about a different subject here, but, you know, I just wanted to say that as a general comment, it really is a big opportunity how diverse the city has become. And this is why the audiences, the audience is so segmented, and this is why, like what Charlie was saying before, again, the pie... Uh, is getting bigger. It's just that it's b getting diverse. It has different colors now, you know. So you really have to 
either, you know, find a way to, you know, this is why you have hyperlocal now, because you have, you know, anyway. So as my co-panelists have noted, we can't cover absolutely everything that moves in our region, in the, in the globe. Um, so with our hyperlocal sites, um, one, where the magic occurs is, and we, we make our correspondents make tremendous efforts to sort of find and identify local bloggers for each, commu each community. So we have a hyper. We do have a hyper local site in Dorchester, one for Roxbury, one for East Boston, and another 48 in our whole area. So what we do, where the magic occurs, is where we can find people with a voice uh, who are already out there or who want to have a voice, uh, and we give them a platform. So all of a sudden we give them sort of the visibility and sort of the market heft and the size and an audience that they otherwise wouldn't have. And we can, and they give us sort of wonderful content that speaks directly to those towns in a way that's sort of different than uh, the other kinds of coverage that we often do. So we're, we're always, we're, we are looking for all those voices and we bring them, we sort of surface them all throughout our Your Town site, parts of the site as well, sort of other parts of Boston.com as well. And that's how we try to uh, make that work. Uh, can I just say another site that's that's been doing that kind of work, which I think is an important piece in our local puzzle, is Universal Hub. And they have been a tremendous aggregator, and Adam Gaffin is probably, you know, it's probably somebody that you guys should have hired a few years back, Caleb, to, to do the, the Your Town idea. But I think what, what, what Adam brings to the table, um, I think, is, is very unique. And he's been, he's been one of the people um, take, finding those voices long before any of us did and, and putting them out there. Adam is insane, um, and, and, and Universal Hub is so good. You know, I think one of the only depressing thing about Universal Hub is that it's not a system. It's one guy. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if he gets hit by a bus, that goes away. Um, and, um, and there's, there's definitely, um, you know, we, the, we sort of consciously um, did not talk a, uh, about new media because I think it's, a, it's such a, it's a, almost a completely different, um, it's very involved. We're all very involved in it, but it's it's its own topic. Um, but Adam does amazing work, and and I think uh, um, if there's if there are developers around who can grab him by the neck and um, and talk um, the code out of him and talk all of his contacts out of him, there's an, uh, there's some amazing stuff that should not go to not go away when he decides to retire. Okay, um, there's. Right, let me just add, oh, I'm I just sorry. To say that I have a platform on my show every Friday. And we partner with uh, all kinds of folks in the community to talk about what is going on. And I ask my partners when they come, the Bills and the Marcellas, uh, to tell me what uh, the stories that are of import to them. I don't select, they select. And then we have a discussion about it. So. Okay. Um, my name is Donna Halper. I'm a media historian, and I'm also a professor at Lesley University. And I wanted to put something out to the radio folks on the panel, but also to anybody that wants to discuss it. Um, I'd like to take it to politics, if I could. Uh, Charlie kind of touched on something, which is a durable myth, namely that the media are liberal. Uh, the fact is that in Boston, and there's nobody from AM or from commercial radio up there, but 95% of all the talk shows that people are hearing every day in Boston are identifiably right-wing conservative. Most of the guests, most of the pundits. Now, I'm not saying on NPR, but I'm saying like people are hearing one side of the story day after day after day. Even the news has been pushed more to the right in the way it's reported. And my concern is that while we're sitting here talking about hyperlocal and talking about you know local voices and that's wonderful, there's a side of the story that isn't represented and that dares not speak its name, namely liberals. And I worry about NPR being pushed farther to the right for fear of the whole funding issue. So I guess my question is, how do you address getting both sides out and making sure that facts are out there when there is so much information that is being misinformed to the public day after day. I could tell you that at the Phoenix, we just try to punch Republicans in the face as much as possible. So we just do that. Um, <laughs> we don't punch anybody in the face. <laughs> um, I, I think this uh, is a, this is like the, the third rail right now, this whole issue of uh, politicization of the media in general. <coughs> Um, if any of you listen to On the Media on public radio, I think you'll find uh, they've done three weeks in a row now of really, really interesting examination of the topic of uh, 
um, alleged bias in uh, public radio, and particularly NPR. And um, I, uh, I was just uh, taking some uh, phone calls uh, as part of our pledge week last week, and it was interesting. I, I didn't have a lot of time to do it, but I took probably 20 phone calls over the course of three days. And I had uh, people yelling at me from the right and from the left. Um, one guy got, you know, uh, got on the phone when I said, hello, this is WBOR. Can I take your name, please? And he said, would you like $100,000? I said, sure, I'd love $100,000. Well, then where are all the socialists? And he started to uh, rant about the fact that there simply were no uh, longer any good socialist voices on uh, uh, WBUR and NPR. And then I also got a similar uh, call in the course of this from, uh, you know, a very kind of predictable uh, conservative voice, except this person was swearing every other word um, and screaming at me. And in both cases, I asked them whether they'd like to... Um, make a donation at the end of the conversation. <laughs> and both of them said, no. Uh, one of them said, I don't have any money. And the other one said, over my dead body. Um, you can figure out which one was which. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, um, I, I think it's uh, the issue that you bring up uh, of whether uh, NPR is actually going to be pushed to the right because of these uh, allegations against it is not an insignificant concern. One of the uh, on the media uh, research uh, projects that was uh, talked about suggested that um, now for uh, a period of over a decade they've done research that suggests that NPR has actually bent over backwards and has slightly more conservative voices than um, uh, progressive voices uh, on its uh, on its air. 65%. It's yeah, sixty five percent in some programs, not 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 all. I mean, but it it is it is. Um, I think I think this is uh, an imperfect world in which there is no such thing as uh, 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 complete nonpartisanship and not, uh, lack of bias, and you're constantly adjusting to work hard if you're committed to that sort of journalism to. Uh, do as good a job as you can of having voices from all political stripes. And um, I think NPR probably does uh, as good a job as any organization in the country at that. But it's never going to satisfy everybody. So I would say that um, on the ground, when you're trying to do a daily show, how it plays out is that it is very difficult to get people to go against their perceptions to come on the show. So if I have a nickel for every time we've tried to get Senator Scott Brown on the show, you know, I would be wealthy today. And, I mean, I just saw him at the Kennedy Library last week. It's perfectly reasonable, but I'm sure his gatekeepers have made a decision based on perception that that's not, you know, he doesn't want to speak on this local radio show. So I think that that's a problem. And then, you know, you're trying to you make certain that all voices are at the table, and I really do try when I say that. I really do mean that. Um, and sometimes that, that stops you. And then the perception persists. This is what kills me. When we were doing all the election coverage, we did every single person in uh, some of these districts, some of the hotly contested ones and some of the ones that weren't. And I had people come and sit in front of me and say, well, <laughs> I guess you're surprised that I, you have me. I said, I've had everybody in the race. Oh, really? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you cannot fight it. I mean, it's just it's like, well, what do you think I'm doing here? Um, so anyway, so it's... It is a process, as Charlie says, but that perception is strong, and it's hard, you know, on the on the ground to work um, work against it, I guess, and to make something happen when you really want to get every everybody's voice at the table. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Hi, how's it going? Uh, my father was on the radio in Rhode Island for about 25 years, and year after year, decade after decade, his station was bought by larger and larger entities. And in the end, uh, his morning show was canceled. He was laid off, and it was replaced by an Opie and Anthony syndication. So my question uh, is, what can be done? Um, if I've always wondered, was, was there anything that could have been done to prevent that from happening? And as a side question, uh, if this has happened to you, which I know it has to some of you, um, 
what is your strategy or what, what have you done to help keep your integrity, to help keep your values without, you know, without losing them if you're being forced to sort of change? Oddly enough, there are very few people who have been bought on this panel. Um, uh, let's see, um, Marcelo, you would be one. <laughs> and, um, and the other one would be the globe. Um, but, you know, and I actually asked you about this the other day, and I thought you had a really interesting um, answer to it. Um, and, and the question I, I asked was, given what happened at the Globe and the, the threat, you know, the sort of threat of the Globe being closed, how did you feel about having non-local ownership? Yeah, I, I guess the answer is, I mean, we were bought in 1993. That's a while ago. Uh, I got here in 2003. I mean, I'm sure there are people here who have been re-globe readers since 1993. So that, that's sort of an ancient history, particularly in uh, media time nowadays, 1993. So I, I think it depends on, frankly, what kind of ownership it is. So, you know, you'll, you won't be surprised for me that I, that I would say it's hard for me to imagine a better owner than the New York Times company. It's a company that has the Salzberger family that's run it for years or has a controlling interest that at its heart, at their heart, in their core, they believe in doing good journalism. It's the good journalism, the mission of doing important work that's where it all starts from. So, uh, and that, that cascades throughout the company. It's, it's part of what they are and therefore sort of part of what we are. So all local ownership isn't, I mean, all ownership isn't equal. And the flip side is, you know, local ownership can be great it can also be scary. You know, if the local uh, boldface names are your owner, the people who, you know, who pull strings and who are very important, say, in Boston or in any city, if they're your owner, that creates its own conflicts. I mean, we all have challenges. I mean, as we just discussed with public radio, it's a challenge of funding. It's a challenge of perception. You cover yourself when you're covering the government. You're covering the comp entity that, that, that's giving you money. So... I think it just depends on the quality of the ownership. So I, I don't know that local is better. I don't know that national is better. I just think it depends. I'm being given the time sign. I didn't know there was a time sign, but that's awesome. Um, we'll do one more. I wanted to make one quick thing there. Um, you know, there's, oddly enough, um, there, there's a, a bunch of us, are, you know, including the, the Times company, it's family ownership. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I say this a lot, that um, I feel lucky to, to, to work for um, a newspaper that, um, is not um, not on the stock market because that's where bad things happen. One, one more. Hello, my name is Shirley Kressel. Uh, I know a couple of you. Um, I write a column for the South End News and uh, have published pieces in other of the papers, the Daily and the Locals. And I want to talk also about politicization, but uh, on a less abstract level. Um, is there a... Um, is there, what I sense there is, is a, a, a deference, if not a fear, of the local actual politicians and uh, advertisers and advertisers in support of politicians. And I've spent like years carrying around packages because I do a lot of investigation of my own. Uh, not just for my column, but I actually feed these stories to other reporters and I can't give it away. People will not touch a lot of this information, which is just factually documented, not <clears throat> you know, paranoid speculation. Uh, so I, I, I'm wondering if I'm misinterpreting it or if there is that kind of a, of a, of a pressure and does it affect different uh, levels, you know, sort of uh, the, the dailies, the, the uh, very locals, the, the BURs, does it affect uh, different ones of those differently? Um, I'll take a crack at that, Shirley. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that the it, it's different for every outfit, depending on you know what the circumstances of the ownership are and what the newsroom is like, and, what, and who you have as talent, um, and who you can put on a, a story. If if somebody comes in our door with a uh, a story like that right now, something that's you know maybe has some needs some real legwork and is controversial on the political end, we can handle it because we have a team of people who are ready to do it. Um, and we've been doing that the last year uh, in large part thanks to, um, to the Northeastern partnership we have because we can dedicate six weeks to a story that probably requires it. Um, but there's other community newspapers that won't be able to do that. 
and uh, I acknowledge that in the past we may have been one of them, that uh, we may not have been able to, 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 to take a five-week chunk of time and, and do an investigative report, and, but the Globe Spotlight team would and can and does. And, and, and that's the real value going forward, I think, is um, to, to find ways to be creative around uh, personnel and um, dedicating staff to doing investigative stories that, that are going to make the powers that be uncomfortable. And we're certainly not going to shy away from that. But the, the, the problem comes to the time commitment. And that's where we really need to be focused on uh, slicing part of our newsroom into that realm and going after stories that like the probation story the Globe did, um, like the community center story we did a couple of weeks ago that are, that are going to challenge uh, City Hall. Yeah, I, I mean, Shirley, I'm not, I don't know exactly what we're talking about. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, it's been kind of a good year for watchdog journalism for many of us at this table. You know, we, Bill happily mentioned the, the probation stories that our spotlight team did that led to the fastest movement by a government agency I've seen in my career in terms of uh, removing people from office and f launching an investigation that's, that's going to be changing how we do probation in Massachusetts. I just scribbled this down. Our, our coverage about Sal de Macy led to indictments of what is now the third speaker in, that, in a row uh, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, tax credits, story by Todd, stories, series of stories by Todd Wallach that looked at the Patrick administration's uh, efforts to give away tax credits that were to corporations where they promised to have job, build, create jobs and then didn't. And our stories showed that, and that's led to changes in how those tax credits are given. Uh, the, we mentioned Robbie and his fighter fighter pension stories, and Sean Murphy uh, about public workers and, and pension and gaming the pension system and how that's changed, and that's led to pension reform in the state. So we're not afraid of that. We're kind of taking it on. They've got the other door open. So I want to thank everybody on this panel. Give them a round of applause, please. That's awesome for a great panel. And thank you all for coming.